the turn and into the stretch and here they come for the final of the little round jab. For nearly 200 years, harness racing has been a feature at American County Fairs. At the Delaware, Ohio County Fair, the Little Brown Jug, a race for three-year-old pacers, debuted in 1946. A jewel in the triple crown of pacing, it draws 40 to 50,000 fans each year to watch the best standard bred horses in the world. There's a unique intimacy between the fans, horses, and drivers at the jug. Only at this event are fans permitted to ring the entire half-mile track to watch the race. Only at the jug do people reserve their spot by chaining their lawn chairs to the fence as early as Memorial Day for a race held on a Thursday in mid-September. On race day, fans can come to the jug barn and see the horses, talk to the drivers, and the track. It's the fastest half-mile track in North America. To record and preserve the stories of fans and professionals who love this event, the Delaware County Historical Society, in partnership with Ohio State's Center for Folklore Studies, embarked on an oral history project to mark the jug's 75th anniversary in 2020. What follows are excerpts from dozens of interviews done by a Historical Society volunteer, Richard Levy, and others. We hope you enjoy their stories. When did you first attend the Little Brown Jug, and what were your impressions? The year was 1946. I was 13 years old, and I had come to the fair with my dad. We, my school had a tent that served food, which was situated right where the Merchants Building is now. And I was to help do dishes at the, at the tent, and also I was a junior fair board, which at that time, I think they chose people from each school to be on the junior fair board. Mm -hmm. And you know, I don't think it had anything to do with 4-H at that time, which it does now. But I was there, and I knew that the Little Brown Jug was running that day, and I had heard that there was a movie star that was going to be there. I was great into movies and it was Charles Coburn, and I thought, I wonder if I could go up there and see him. And so I was up at the grand, in front of the grandstand, which at that time it was just grass from there to the track, and there were no bleachers, just the grandstand. And I went up, and as a young person, I could walk in and out, and it didn't matter. And I saw a bunch of people, and I did happen to see Charles Coburn, and when everybody else sort of moved away, I went up and asked him if I could have his autograph, and he did give it to me. And um, so that was the first jug. I really didn't, my dad knew who Wayne Smart, Curly Wayne Smart was, knew he was running in the race, but it didn't yeah. do much for me at that time, but I was up there and I did watch it. I don't remember whether my dad got to see it or not. I think he probably did. So that was the first time and that I saw the jug. I first, the first time I, I uh, attended the jug was 1965. Okay. That, was, that was the first year. I came up here to see uh, Brett Hanover. And uh, when I left Xenia, it was pouring down rain. It rained all the way. Yeah. And when I got here, I was uh, sh sure that they weren't going to have the races because I had taken off from work oh. to come up here to do it. <laughs> well, I came to the fairground and I was standing by and I, and uh, Curly Smart was standing there and, and I, I wondered what they were doing because they were, uh, they had these machines that were taking and they were rolling the mud off of the track after the rain had stopped. And I asked him, I said, what are you, he said, well, we're getting the track ready for, for racing. He said, we'll have it ready by the time we get ready to race. And sure enough, when the race time came, the track was actually dusty. I first came to the jug in 1976. It was the first year that I got married. Paul and I came down with some friends 
and I was just intrigued. I, I couldn't believe there was something like this going on in harness racing and had such a great time. That was What makes the Little Brown Jug special? Is because it's at a county fair and it draws so many people. We get so many more people on Jug Day than any other race. The Hamiltonian and the Jug are, are like the two major races in harness racing. I'm sure we still draw more horses or more people than the, the uh, Hamiltonian. And, but it's at a county fairground where all the fans that just walk off the street, come to a race once a year, can come right to the horses, the drivers, the trainers. They can go everywhere on the fairground except the paddock area. Well, it's raced on a Thursday. That is part of the tradition that I don't think will ever change. It is the tradition, part of the tradition, part of the lore of the jug is the fact that it, it's raced at a county fair circuit. It's a big time race that, and that's why the drivers, at least most of them that I've heard of, love to come to the jug because it's a throwback to way, the way racing was 50, 100 years ago at, Dela, at county fairs. Here on, on jug day, and there's gonna be eight, 10, 12, 15 people deep, but they're walking the horses right past them to get to the paddock so they can go race. So yeah, you don't you won't get that at the Meadowlands. You won't get that really anywhere. And we are classified a county fair. And you can get that at, at county fairs, but not all county fairs are going to have the horses racing for a part of the Triple Crown um, or for seven hundred thousand dollars like we race for here. You've seen quite a few races. Which ones would you say are the most memorable? Yes, Brett Hanover, my favorite, 1965. There's been others since, and these people will say, and even Roger, it, this was the best year, the best year, the best year. But um, that morning, they had to peel the track, meaning uh, everything on the top, they just roll it right to the top, take off the top layer, because at that point in time, Delaware was not an all-weather track. And so now we are and we can race in some, with some rain and so forth, but at that time, they literally had to take off a lot of moisture, not a lot of dirt off the track because of moisture, put it to the top side, and by three o'clock in the afternoon, he was setting world records, and the sun came out, and we had to water the track. My first one, because Governor Skipper won so easy, but being a kid and being first time at that, you know, we came from the county fairs mainly, and it was, it's like a whole different world coming to the Delaware Fair, to the jug. But the one that stands out the most, probably the two, is Life Signs win. But I was lucky enough to be in the one with Wiglet Jiglet. I had lost for words that got beat by a nose. I know. And it, it was an amazing race. Life Sign win an incredible race. But for my horse, Lost for Words, and Wiglet Jiglet to battle from just past the quarter pole all the way to the wire, looked like I had him beat at the head of the stretch, and he was tough enough. He came back and beat me a nose right at the wire. There's a lot behind my number one jug, Wiglet Jiglet, 2015. Wiglet Jiglet, and I think, Part of it had to do with the name. It was a name that everybody liked. Montrell Tig, a young man driving. George Tig, his father, the owner, and Clyde Francis, the trainer. Uh, they went everywhere to race. And they became a legend well before they ever got to the Little Brown Jug. And I can remember the night before the Jug, I went to dinner with George Teig and Montrell Teig and other friends right here in Delaware. And uh, we talked about the race and everything like that. And there'd been rumors of, that uh, Wiglet had had some problems and he couldn't get around a half mile track and 
George says, oh, I don't think that will be a problem here in Delaware. Well, it was a problem because going into the, the final, he made a few bad steps in that first term. Montrell didn't want it to happen in another turn, so he tipped him to the outside and raced on the outside of Lost for Words and David Miller, the Brian Brown horse. And I know when you interviewed Brian, uh, his comment that it took weeks for him to accept that loss. I still think to this day that was the greatest horse race ever contested in harness racing. Two horses lost for words, wiggle it, jiggle it, stride for stride, nose to nose, toe to toe. The battle turned into a war down the backside. Lost for words opens up by a length and a quarter coming out of the final turn. Montrell Tig thought, we're beat. George Teague, his quota, said, I couldn't look at the finish because I knew we were beat. But somehow, wiggle it, jiggle it, the heart of a champion came back and in the final stride got lost for words at the wire. And to me, the 2015 Little Brown Jug was the greatest harness race of all time. Uh, honestly, my favorite's 92, 1992. Most people don't talk about it, but uh, they had a horse called Western Hanover who was going for the Triple Crown. He had won the Cane and won the Messenger. Uh, he was tr trained by Gene Regal, who happened to be our Wall of Fame honoree that year. So here he is. He's getting inducted into our Wall of Fame. He has a chance to be a Triple Crown winner. Uh, then we had a horse by the name of Fake Left who was going to be driven by Mickey McNichol. Uh, who was kind of a journeyman at the time. And Mickey gets hurt a couple races before the jug when his sulky actually comes loose and he gets dumped to the track. So they take him to Grady Memorial Hospital to get checked out. And so now you have a Hall of Fame trainer, George Schulte, who brings this horse in his later years of his career to Delaware and uh, has to find a substitute driver and picks Ron Waples, who's a Hall of Famer in his own right. So uh, the first heat... Uh, fake left beats Western Hanover by a head. You know, the second heat, you know, they come back and Western Hanover beats fake left by a head, and then they have to come back for the race off. So, in the race off, Western fake left beats Western Hanover by a head, and or actually by a nose. How would you say the jug has changed over the years? <sighs> um, you know, the racing somewhat, I mean, obviously the horses are bred for speed more. Um, not as much for endurance, so that changes a little bit of how people train. Um, but just to the sport itself and how it affects us here, probably to me the biggest change is simulcasting. Uh, now um, I think that uh, um, the crowds, they are a little bit smaller because of the availability, I think, to bet off track. Um, you know, more people can keep track of the uh, events on the internet, um, and as a result of that, uh, the crowds have just kind of gotten smaller. And I think, too, that um, we don't quite have that party atmosphere in downtown Delaware that we had, you know, 30, 35 years ago, which is uh, probably okay, you know, as a police officer. But I think the thing that really impressed me early on was how dressed up everybody was. I mean, I'd see people that I'd seen, you know, just because they were friends of my parents, but Boy, they really dressed up differently when it came to jug day. So all the men in suits. Oh my goodness, yes. And women were, were dressed and some of them had hats and uh, it was quite the style show. Mm-hmm. And now it's, you know, shorts and t-shirts or whatever to make you comfortable up there. So that's... What traditions about the jug do you think should never be changed? One tradition that I hope will never change is the way it is right now where they come back for a second heat. I can't help but feel, and there's been some talk, by horsemen at least, 
and even the jug society about having eliminations for the jug on Sunday and then the final one dash for the cash on Thursday. It's my opinion if they did that you would automatically lose 10,000 fans on jug day because those fans come there to see a two heat battle and uh, that's one tradition that uh, I hope never changes. Well, the, the county fair atmosphere, obviously. Um, the race conditions, I think, I think the Jug Society has to be fluid with that, so I'm not going to go out on a limb and say anything about the, the format of the race at this point, because you don't know how things are going to play out in the future. And, um, but I think uh, the, the county fair atmosphere, those people on top of the track, um, you know, the, just the excitement of, of the event and the intimacy of the fans. But I think. the jug should always be heat racing. The jug should always stay in Delaware on the half mile track. Okay. On Thursdays? That's a toughie. That's a toughie because so many people now their job has changed. Um, it's unique to have the major harness race on a Thursday afternoon in Ohio and not on the East Coast. So, yeah, okay. I wouldn't change a thing. What, if anything, do you think needs to be done so the jug is sustained or even advanced into the future? The purse has to get to a million dollars. I don't know how, but I think that'll solve half the problem of people skipping the jug. I think those horses or trainers or owners have skipped the jug. If the purse was a million dollars, they might change their mind. Sure. Well, first I'd fix the restrooms. <laughs> make it, I'd just make that whole Done. down, <laughs> that whole part down there, just be a little nicer and not so, not so primitive because uh, some of it's kind of primitive. Mm -hmm. So that would be one thing. Um, I, I think it would be nice to somehow advertise racing uh, to the whole community some. It all comes down to marketing. I am on the board with, you know, I get what Jeff says, the growl, that we need to market the sport. Like anything else that's successful markets, you know, we think we're just going to show up and people are going to show up. No, we got to let people know it's out there and we can get them to see our product. Once people come, they love our sport. You just got to get them here to see it. And we've started the process of it. Um, and that is upgrading of our facilities will make a big difference, not only to the jug, to the fair, um, but to Delaware County um, and all the above. Well, I mean, I think the big thing that we, we need is money. Uh, John Campbell is on our, our jug society and he says, for, if you guys race for a million bucks, they would race up and down 23. You know, I mean, if you make the purse what it should be or needs to be, you're going to draw the best horses. Uh, people forget we only race five days a year. Uh, Scioto Downs races, I think, 65 days a year. But they run the slot machines 365 days a year. So they're, they're getting revenue 365 days a year. We're getting revenue five days a year. So. What you have seen is only a fraction of the video and audio interviews that make up the Little Brown Jug Oral History Project. To learn more about the project and access the full collection of photos, interviews, and transcripts, visit the project's archive at https colon slash slash delawareohiohistory.org slash little hyphen brown hyphen jug hyphen oral hyphen history hyphen project. This project was made possible by the efforts of Mr. Jay Wolf, Dr. Cassie Patterson and her graduate students at the Ohio State University's Center for Folklore Studies, the Ohio Humanities Council, the Little Brown Jugs Society, the Delaware County District Library, the United States Trotting Association, Dr. Kyle McDaniel of Ohio Wesleyan University, 
and the dedicated volunteers of the Delaware County Historical Society. Thank you. Thank mm-hmm. you.